Good morning, all of you, and thank you so much for having us here. Uh, first of all, I must uh, congratulate Anil for having that wonderful presentation. It was quite enlightening. And uh, I think uh, something which uh, stayed with me, uh, you know, being a journalist, sometimes we have a very macro view on each industry. But uh, what stayed with me is how technology plays a very crucial role in ensuring that every household in India or every car in India gets the energy that it needs or gets the fuel that it needs. Uh, the second thing which stayed with me obviously was that uh, though we are growing at a rapid pace, but even by 2040, our, our energy mix is going to be unique. And that's why I think we need to be much more conscious about how we are using digitization and technology uh, rightly to improve our uh, future security as far as our energy security is concerned. So on that note, I'll start the discussion. And uh, followed by discussion will be a town hall where uh, we'll take questions from all of you. Uh, so wait for that. Uh, thank you so much, all of you, for joining us, and morning to all of you. Alok, I'll start with you only, because, uh, <coughs> you know, I mean, the three gentlemen sitting on the extreme corner are the ones who are, uh, I would say, key engines of uh, India's uh, uh, entire energy mission. So, Alok, I'll start with you. As we saw in the presentation also, today, I think more than ever before, uh, what matters is how uh, companies are implementing technology, digitization, and how that layer on top of your ops. Uh, and intelligence is helping you achieve uh, excellence, uh, better efficiency. So first of all, if you can give us a macro overview about where we stand today as a nation and as oil and gas industry, where are we? So, uh, about Indian oil, I'll say we are uh, the, the uh, leading oil and gas downstream company. Of course, we are into the upstream also now. But uh, we are having 11 refineries of over 15,000 kilometers of pipeline, serving almost 50% of the customers. And uh, the, coming to the topic about the digital journey, so what I will uh, say is that uh, we have a fairly well developed IT setup in Indian oil, which is started with uh, the ERP implementation way back 20 years ago, but we have a fairly well-established IT setup. Of course, we, are, we have also given cognizance to the uh, digital uh, transformation which has been happening with the uh, Industry 4.2 having come into picture. So we have done an uh, uh, elaborate study of our IT setup that is almost one and a half years back. And uh, we have drawn out the, uh, the areas where digital intervention can bring efficiency, safety, or reliability in our operations. Of course, the IT setup, as I said, our refineries or pipeline setup, or our day-to-day -day operations, even customer-facing operations, all of you know about the implementation of the DBTEL and Ujjwala scheme. These are all, they were all enabled through digital methods only. Otherwise, it would have been impossible to penetrate into the uh, deep, into the villages and do the, uh, collect their KYCs and give the connections immediately. But uh, nevertheless, we have uh, done an uh, elaborate study of what digital transformation can bring to us. And now we are in the process of implementing that. Uh, all the, whatever the uh, digital initiatives we have identified. Besides that, we are very committed to the digital part, like we are going to set up a digital center of excellence in our company. It's already on, the, all the processes are on. And uh, in order to harness the technology, new technologies like AI, ML, some of them are under implementation, but then, the, there are elaborate plans to have an enterprise-wide network so that we can comprehensively use the power of this technology. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, uh, Rajneesh, if you can share your experience with us, because, uh, you know, I mean, together, all the oil PSUs in India account for almost uh, uh, 70 to 80 percent of end-to-end -end business, uh, even today. What is your experience and how advanced our PSU giants are when it comes to uh, implementing digitization and technology and using it effectively. 
so uh, as we see our uh, industry today, I mean, we have been using technology. I think Schneider is there 100 years old, so I think the technologies are also as old as Schneider today in our refineries and processes. So sometimes in our company, people say that, what are you talking about digitalization? We have been using it in the refineries for so many years. But what is happening now and what we are getting ready today is if I divide a company like ours or Indian Oil into a marketing, a refining, and you know, basically the support business kind of functions. So a lot of digitalization, a lot of digital technologies have been adopted by each and every one. But what we are now trying to do using uh, the current emerging technologies is to try and create an intelligent link between them. So once you have the intelligence between the connected nodes, what I believe, they say that even though the oil companies claim that they are too good in operational excellence, but 14, 15% of the value is still lying on the table. And that is the value we want to take in next two to three years time, because though it looks very rosy for oil sector in India, because next 15 years, we are expecting four and a half, five percent growth, the demand will become double. But at the same time, we want to be ready for the low carbon future when, you know, the Basically, the margins will be under severe pressure and the growth will not be there. So how do you, you know, get there into the low carbon future without getting your balance sheet? I think that is basically the challenge uh, with all of us. So we, are, we have done it a little tactically. Now, as they say that 2018 and 18 was the year of, uh, you know, digital as a strategy for oil and gas. I mean, it started with the digital as a curiosity in 2014. Now we have come to the digital, digital as a strategy. So that is one step we want to take to adopt digital as a strategy and try and put a chain, put a, put a, you can across the whole value chain, we put a digital layer and then get ready for the competition and the times when the growth and margins and then everything will be under pressure. That's right. Uh, Indra, you also, I mean, obviously you contribute almost 25% of uh, um, the India's crude and refining production right now. Uh, I mean, you know, what is your sense? Because going forward, uh, and especially in the kind of uh, geopolitical environment where we are and the kind of uh, energy consumption projections that we have, obviously much more needs to be done. So unless uh, countries like India, uh, they become leaders uh, in industrial revolution, uh, you know, the 4.0 that we are talking about. Uh, I mean, is there a genuine possibility that if we don't implement that or uh, adapt that uh, faster, uh, then we may face challenges in terms of improving our efficiency production, maintaining safety? Uh, thanks, Mihir. So before I take up the question directly, let me give a quick uh, overview about uh, Kane Oil and Gas Vedanta Limited's operations in India. So we are the largest crude producer, private crude producer in India, and uh, we are at around uh, 190,000 to 200,000 barrels of oil and oil equivalent per day. So that amounts to almost 25% of India's domestic production. As per, our Mr. As per our chairman, Mr. Anil Agarwal, and uh, our CEO, Mr. Ajay Dikshit, vision, so that 25% of the share needs to go to 50%. So that amounts to almost 500,000 uh, uh, oil equivalent per day production. So having that kind of business vision, uh, it is very much important to ensure that digital enablers are present and in Kane, what we have done is like we have made a, a, a digital strategic program, which we call as a digital Nirman, Project Nirman, through which we have ensured that all the strategic imperatives cutting across the value chain of the oil and gas industry, especially from the exploration and production standpoint, are addressed. So when we are talking about exploration, it starts with uh, your geological and uh, uh, geophysical studies. So the challenge there is like the, the volume and velocity of the data. Uh -huh. So how quick you can get the data from the seismic service 
And I sincerely believe that IoT-enabled technologies along with uh, the cloud will play a major role here. Because, you know, the, the current cycle of getting that data, processing it, and uh, uh, making some information out of it takes months and months of time. Maybe in some cases five to six months to complete a seismic study and get some value out of it. So if we have digital interventions in this space, then it can be reduced to maybe a few weeks where your IoT enabled uh, uh, geo phones which get the, the uh, information from your seismic study can be connected uh, to the, the seismic truck, to the cloud. So that kind of uh, innovations are possible, available nowadays, and uh, I believe all the operators are going in that direction. Again, if I come to uh, the, the reservoir management, which is a very important uh, piece of uh, 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 exploration and production company, so there are a lot of digital technologies are available which will help us to understand that how the productions are going to be, how can we characterize the reservoir, how much oil is present in the subsurface level. So starting from exploration to subsurface management to your asset integrity, so everywhere I see the possibility of uh, digital interventions are, are present. And in Kane, we are very much committed. We like to work with uh, partners like Snyder and uh, take this journey forward. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, Vishnu, what's your take? Like, uh, you know, Indra mentioned, uh, if we were to look at uh, a technology which can actually enable end-to-end -end solution and somewhere create a unified uh, mechanism as far as operations and the data management is concerned, I think that will be very critical for the future success. Uh, what's your take on that? Because you play a very vital role, and I believe you cater to uh, many of the yeah. <laughs> gentlemen present here. Sure. Uh, so this touching upon where Rajneesh left off on the intelligence mm. part, right? Mm. What we see digital doing is shifting the organization's focus from systems of record to systems of intelligence. Mm. That's how we see, right? I mean, we have had digital. I mean, all these computers and all were always digital. Right? Yeah. But the new digital, new, new wave of digital, what it is doing is shift that focus totally towards the intelligence. Earlier we were only doing the record keeping, control systems and all that. Now we are putting intelligence into everything, right? That's what it is doing. Uh, at the second level, how we see this digital changing, uh, the way we do businesses is at two, two uh, levels. One is the here and now. Uh, you know, as we go forward into the day, we'll see a lot of challenges and you know how the technology can be used in different scenarios. Uh, but at a very high level, one thing is here and now. Uh, I need to prevent leakages in my pipeline or I need to improve efficiencies in my refinery or I need to prevent hazards, uh, hazardous situations, improve safety, reliability of the machines. So all of these are things that we need to do here and now, right? That is one from a digital standpoint. But at second level, what we are seeing, having worked with several di digital leaders in India and uh, globally as well, what I see is that there is a second wave which comes once you get onto the digital journey. Uh, I have worked with construction companies, hardcore construction companies, uh, who adopted digital, IoT and AI. And they suddenly transformed and said, hey, you know what, we'll just no longer remain in the construction industry. We will launch a new company which offers digital solutions. Mm. Right. So we have uh, we worked with elevators companies who stopped supplying elevators and they say no, we'll not supply elevators. We'll supply movement as a service or elevator as a service. Right. So once you get into the digital business, you never know where it goes. Mm. So from a digital standpoint, what I see is doing the here and now. But then once you are into the journey, several new models evolve from a business standpoint. That's, that's what I see. I think that's an interesting point. Uh, and Rajneesh, in fact, uh, I'll need your view on that. Uh, th it's very critical that, uh, you know, for companies and organizations, there is a clear-cut, defined uh, digital roadmap of uh, maybe 15, 20, 30 years down the line exactly where the organization should be and what kind of digital strategy it should implement to bring out maximum efficiency. So uh, is that happening in India? What is your overview if we uh, consider Indian industry? So I think now everyone is moving from the tactical to the strategic uh, part of the digital. So like we are in the midst of a journey and we are now doing the envisioning part and also trying to get into the engaging part where we can truly say that where we want to be. So we, want, we are doing it with each and every business that 
where you are today and where you want to be and what all resources are required. Now, what kind of skill set will be needed? What kind of leadership is required? What kind of support is needed? And at the same time, we are trying to even do some of the cultural hacks because the culture, unfortunately, has a very long memory. So the people who are heading some of our businesses are there because they have possibly, they have been quite risk averse and you know, the agility was something which was missing in a business like ours, which is almost guaranteed. You set up a gas station and you know that how much it is going to sell and how much, how much margin you are going to make. So almost you can say that people exactly know by and large that what is going to be my balance sheet at the end of the year. Mm. So with those kind of people now successful now, what kind of cultural hack we can do? Can we do the reverse mentoring? So those are the changes we are trying to bring, but the first and foremost is the envisioning part, that where I want to be, and then what I have to do about it. But I think the three things which I feel so far the journey, which have been very important, the major problem with the two, with the companies like ours, big companies, one is the inertia, because they take a lot of time and energy to move, and once they move, then they get into the entropy part where they don't, um, it's difficult for them, big companies, to keep a direction because a lot of forces are pulling them here and there. So we are trying to overcome this, but it's being driven by the leadership. So in our company, for example, I can say that I come, come from the business. So the chief digital officer kind of office is run by the business. So I have some tech guys. It reports to the chairman. So I, I think the digital transformation is only possible top down by the strong executive action, but you have to create some buy-in. So we are trying to experiment with all this, and I think most of the oil companies in India are almost in that stage, even globally also. Shell and BPs and those kind of companies, they are also you know, still in the digital strategy stage. Some of their experiments have gone little far. Some of our experiments, like he talked about the Ujwala, is possibly the biggest digital experiment ever happened in the history of the oil industry and that's what even the Americans and World Economic Forum they acknowledge. Okay, how can you bring 120 million people without any additional manpower from the oil industry without much of the extra expenditure, get them the, you know, the fuel, accepted, fuel uh, excess. So all that is happening, so some places we are ahead, but I think we are in the midst of the midst of the that journey of digital transformation. In some areas, somebody is moving faster. Some areas, somebody is moving little slower. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, Rajat, you cater to obviously the, you know the majority chunk of it when it comes to this industry. What is your experience? Uh, are companies in India keeping pace when it comes to digital transformation? And is there a vision? And I mean, I'm sure there is. But at a strategic level that, you know, maybe uh, one or two decades from now, or if we take that uh, uh, report as a reference, then maybe by 2040, <coughs> how uh, the digital transformation and technology implementation is going to drive higher safety, better efficiency, uh, and more reliability uh, for this sector. Yeah, so <coughs> let me start by giving a macro view as yeah. on, on sentiment. Uh, I'm very optimistic. Mm -hmm. First of all, extremely optimistic about where the industry is going. And especially when I hear my when I hear my fellow panelists talking, uh, I'm optimistic about India. Mm -hmm. I'm optimistic about oil and gas in India, which is slightly contrarian to the worldview. But I'm also very optimistic about digital transformation in India, which is actually more or less aligned with the worldview. And here's why here's why I say that. So. Uh, in India, we know that we have, in spite of having a very minimal upstream business uh, or, or, or outtake, uh, we have among the largest uh, refineries in, in the world, right? That's already an innovation if you think about it from right. the whole cycle uh, point of view. Uh, but also what often goes under the scanner is that we are the largest nursery, nursery of global talent. Yeah? So uh, our skill sets, our talents, we are not running refineries only in India. Hmm. We are running refineries from the developed world in UK, for example, uh, right to uh, the new age uh, countries, I can say, so they are coming up with, with oil and gas, such as the ones in Nigeria and Africa, etc. So uh, we are 
a global nursery of talent and it only gets better because the next generation, the millennials that are coming up, uh, they are digital native. Yeah. Now, that may be a global phenomenon, but for us here in India, we have to be proud that we are driving that culture. So, uh, uh, I mean, for example, uh, my, my son, he has an argument with my daughter about which is the best platform for communication, right? <laughs> and what they're talking about is uh, between gaming communication platforms and, uh, you know, WeChat or something like that. Uh, I come from the SMS generation, right? So, so you can see the pace at which the technology is changing by generation. This reflects directly into operations and processes. Mm. So uh, the conversations that I have, we have with our customers today with the end users, some of them are sitting on the panel, uh, are very interesting. And one word which I often hear in these conversations is confusion. Okay. Right? Now, I'd like to call it differently. <laughs> I'd like to call it disruption. This is the place. We are in the right place at the right time. You see disruption happening every day in our end user space, in our space as equipment suppliers, in our conversations. And that disruption, mind you, we are leading the world. We are leading the world, the quality of the conversations we are having about digital disruption, digital transformation, is what is driving backward into the world, and it's not the other way around. So I am very optimistic about the way we are going in the industry. I will come to uh, how the aspects of uh, reliability and, and, and uh, you know, safety will drive our uh, profitability in my next session when you give me a chance. Yeah, absolutely. But Navtej, uh, you know, I would just like to extend what uh, Rajat was mentioning. Uh, effectively, if we are leading the disruption, uh, can we say that we are also leading Industrial Revolution 4.0 when it comes to this industry in terms of not only innovation but even implementation and effectively uh, the execution of uh, uh, because because you know oil and gas as a business if you look at it it's not only about uh, creating those assets it's also sustaining them throughout their life cycle and keeping them at optimum efficiency levels so are we leading that part of uh, uh, innovation in uh, industry 4.0 scenario yeah um Good question. As Rajneesh said, um, in some areas we are leading, in other areas we are not leading. Mm -hmm. But as we go forward to meet the demand that's needed, we have a limited set of resources and we have certain emission um, out outputs to meet. With the limited set of resources we have, we have to lead both on upstream, midstream and downstream to make the most of those resources. And if we can't do that, we won't be able to meet c consumption and demand. So for me, it's not a question of are we leading or where are we ranked. I think for India to progress and to b meet forward the challenges in the next 20 years, we have no choice but to take that lead. And we're already showing we have the technology, we have the people in the country to be able to do that. And. Um, the refining industry is a great example, as uh, Rajat has said. In terms of refining technology, the most complex refineries in the world are in India. The most largest refineries in the world are also in India. So already in some areas, we are the leaders. In other areas, we also need to take this opportunity to lead. And um, I was reading a report very recently which said, uh, in terms of the Industrial Revolution, or 4.0, Countries like India have to be at the forefront of it. And it will be India that will be one of the key leaders as we go forward. Otherwise, we won't be able to meet our consumption and demand needs. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, please. So I would like to take a, a hit on that. So um, see, traditionally what has happened, the operations technology and your plant control systems were isolated. Yeah. So at present, the the, the we are standing at an inflection point of industry 4.0 and to me that is like uh, uh, the information technology and the operations technology are getting merged. The boundary between these two things are getting blurred day by day. So it is no more an option for the, the end users like us. It is going to be a, a competitive advantage. So we need to adopt digitalization 
and make sure the digital transformation is percolated down from the top level to the bottom level of our industry. Mm -hmm. But just to add to that, <coughs> like you mentioned, since these two uh, uh, probably platforms which are operating in silos, as they merge going forward, uh, what kind of opportunities and threats they create? As you bridge the divide between OT and IT, mm. and that becomes merged and becomes meshed, I think that's where you're really going to start to see the impact of digitization because that's going to give you a lot of data. Mm. And if we can get the right data to the right people at the right time, that's going to give you operational insight. And once you get operational insight on your business, that's when you can start to improve your business, efficiencies, reliability, safety. So I think bridging this ITOT divide that Indra talks about is critical for moving forward on our digitization needs. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I think uh, we also need to take care of the threat, which is a cybersecurity threat in this case, because okay. earlier the, these two silos were air-gapped, right? So now it is integrated. So you are exposed to the, the cyber vulnerabilities and threats from the, the outside external world. So we need to ensure that when we are taking the, the baby steps toward digitalization, the, the safety aspect and the cyber security aspects are not compromised. The confidentiality, integrity, and availability of the data in parlance of uh, cyber security needs to be considered at every stage, whatever applications we develop and implement. Yeah, Raja? Yeah, and actually, just, just picking up from what Navtej and Ranish just said, so uh, what, what does digitization really do? I mean, it tends to become a bit of a fad, the word, but we're talking about silos, right? And we're talking about uh, how digitization can help us break the silos. It's, it is about technology. Uh -huh. It's about removing constraints. Lo so typically, uh, well, what was the issue earlier? Why did we have the silos in the first place? The silos were because each of these specialized areas had different specific requirements. Uh -huh. I mean, just to keep it as simple as possible, uh, process controls tends to be more analog. You're, you're working with analog signals. So, and and uh, electrical controls, or power as we call it, tends to be digital. Mm -hmm. And the response time requirements are also typically different. So these were, these were the silos. Now also, the fact that <clears throat> in today's uh, knowledge or data, to convert that into insight, it's not just about data. It's about converting data into insights which you can use to run your business operations more efficiently. We just didn't have that capability earlier to be able to manage that amount of data and convert it into what's really knowledge. Today, technology provides that platform. Technology provides the platform in two ways. The ability to crunch that data and give the insights and drive our operators in the direction towards more profitability, yeah. but also the ability to cut across platforms and you know, analyze data which is coming from different sources. So I'll just give you an example. You've got process real-time data. Yeah. You've got historical data. You also got data from the cloud, which is coming from outside. Yeah. And considering all those cybersecurity considerations and all that stuff, you are now able to do a analysis of that data and give output in real time. And that is the difference that digitization has brought about to this industry in real terms, which is the difference from what we could do yesterday to what we will do tomorrow. Yeah. In fact, I was referring to the uh, presentation and there was there were some interesting data points that how it can actually improve profitability by roughly around 3% and bring down the CAPEX and OPEX as well. So in fact, uh, Rajneesh and Alok, if you can share your experience or maybe share some examples for the benefit of audience that how it actually helps in improving the profitability also and at the same time, uh, uh, you know, the CAPEX uh, and uh, improvement of overall efficiency so uh, one uh, you know it's it's kind of a vision which we are trying to work on today we get 15000 retail outlets are visible to us in the control room sitting in bombay hmm. i exactly know how much of the fuel each retail outlet is having now <coughs> using the data we are capturing each and every transaction if i can truly put some intelligence into the system then I would, will be knowing that how much of the fuel will be bought by my customers tomorrow and next 30 days. Now, when we are importing a parcel, sometimes we end up with the higher inventories mm. because we do the back casting mostly 
and we find out that we could have avoided this, so it would have saved us 80 crores. So now I would like to leave this to the basically the machine learning and those kind of forecasts, whether I should import or not. And this impact is very huge on LPG. Like today we are sitting here in Onam. I don't know how much of extra dishes will be made in Kerala if there will be 20 dishes. So how much of the impact it will have on the LPG consumption in Kerala? If, and I exactly know how much my customers are consuming. So if I put a lot of intelligence into it, then I exactly know when we are importing 60% of LPG in our country and many times the parcels are coming and waiting because suddenly the demand dipped, maybe the temperature went up or something like that and people were not eating a lot of non-vegetarian and fried stuff, so something <laughs> happened and we end up with extra excess inventory. So that has a huge impact, the inventory itself has a huge impact on our, uh, you know, basically on our balance sheet. So that's one area which we are trying to look at little more closely. Right. Hello? So what I will share is that uh, this, uh, the whole process of digitization, uh, I mean, there were certain manual operations like our oil terminals. They are supplying to our uh, petrol pumps who are serving you all. Now the whole process of supplying to these uh, retail outlets was manual. So somebody has to place a paper indent manually and then somebody will do the certain transactions in ERP system and then the things will go. Today it's all automated, it works on mobile app or SMS and uh, there is no intervention in the ERP also and the truck gets loaded, the automation system interacts with the ERP, prints the invoice, it goes, the acknowledgement is also all automated. So this is how the efficiency has been brought in. Similarly, uh, if you talk about the safety things, so very small feature but very uh, good for the uh, customer facing organizations like ours, that when a delivery boy is carrying cylinder to your home, <coughs> is it possible for me to send you the intimation that XYZ is coming? Is it also possible for me to share his photograph with you, which adds to the safety? So th these are all possible, and they are, they are actually happening. Coming back to the uh, ITOT integration, what I feel is that uh, there are OT systems and they are generating huge amount of data. They, it's all lying in our vaults, mm -hmm. and time is very ripe for us to apply the power of AI, ML, IoT, what not. It's all there with us. I mean, IoT can only supplement, but already there is a lot of data in historians. Uh -huh. And the, 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 it's only thing, as, thing is that there have to be customized solution suiting to industry specific needs. Uh -huh. The oil industry or a refinery may be having a different kind of need. But yes, there is an ample scope for process optimization, ample scope for energy optimization, and uh, of course, safety. So, uh, and uh, we are all aware about it and we are going in that direction. We already implement, trying to implement all those things. And uh, I really feel that, yes, it's an exciting opportunity. And uh, Rajat, the next two years that. journey of Indian oil will bring... <laughs> Actually, to Alok's point, and, and that's a very good end-user perspective, he talked about not just operational efficiency, he was also talking about safety. Yeah. And I'd like to submit here a very important point. We do business for one objective. Unfortunately, it is profitability. <laughs> we, we do it for profit. That's what gives us stakeholders. That's what gets us salaries, right? Charity comes later. It is important. It's a noble cause. But first you make profit, then you do charity. Now, you, you asked a question about profitability, which you, there are pieces of the answer. I'd like to bring it together. Yeah, please. So uh, we focus a lot of time and investment on operational efficiency, yeah. which is what Rajesh was also mentioning. And Alok mentioned a little about safety. Now, it's very clear that safety also feeds into profitability because if you don't have a safe operation, your plant equipment is not protected, you won't have people doing the job for you. Yeah. People won't be there. And in oil and gas specifically, you put people next to an explosive, flammable product right. all the time. So safety then becomes even more paramount, otherwise you won't have anybody run the plant. 
the other I think one is yeah. that second is also the safety of the asset itself uh, exactly so i said about plant and equipment <laughs> yeah, and yeah. the and the uh, so all your assets whether human or plant hmm. and equipment hmm. but the third part we probably speak less about but we know intuitively is reliability hmm. now obviously all that operational efficiency is u useless if your plant is shut down <laughs> so so you need to increase the uh, uh, you know running time or reduce the downtime of the plant now these are parameters and we focus not just investment but automation hmm. on real time automation on operational efficiency and we often forget the impact that safety and reliability have on that yeah now what digital does or what digitization does is it tries to automate not just the operational efficiency part of it or improve operational efficiency <laughs> but also automate or in in a way put in the loop of automation reliability and safety and why can we do that today and tomorrow and why couldn't we do that yesterday because of constraints because the financial analysis of data was not possible the ability to connect and capture data was not possible today digital transformation has brought about uh, removal of those technology constraints and therefore today automation can actually become the profit engine of your business of tomorrow Oh, that's an interesting yeah. point. Uh, Vishnu, you wanted to... Yeah, so just touching upon that, update. you know, the automation part, right? So, mm -hmm. fantastic point Rajat is bringing about. Uh, see, typically what we have seen is the control systems which are out there. Let's say mm -hmm. if I have a pump control system, they have always been reactive. They will keep on feeding to the SCADA what is happening. That's, that only tells what is happening, right? Uh, it doesn't tell what is going to happen. So now what is happening is these control systems are becoming intelligent. That's where we keep talking about the ITOT integration. Uh, it's not that we are just, you know, amalgamating everything, but we are making one work in tandem with the other. Earlier, these control systems would either feed a SCADA or maybe that data will go and sit somewhere else, right, in an IT system. Not we are, now what we are bringing with the IOT and the something new which is called edge capability, now we can build a nice machine learning or a predictive algorithm which says that, okay, this control system is, or this particular equipment is going to have this particular problem, but that would be a post facto analysis earlier. Now I can bring that algorithm and put and bring it up and put it at the control system level. Hmm. Now control system is not only telling me what is happening, it will also tell me what is going to happen, right? That's exactly what Schneider and Microsoft did right, in one of their pump control systems, we embedded the AI into the, into a chip on that, right. Now at the real time it tells what's going to happen. It's not like, you know, post fact after one hour or, 20 hour or 24 hours, one day it will tell, right. That's one. Second coming to, let's say that was in the upstream scenario. In the downstream scenario, uh, both from a safety as well as operational efficiency standpoint, we have seen several refineries using the data which comes from the equipment very, very intelligently. Uh, we worked with a refinery in Hungary. Uh, what they do is, on the, uh, on the coking plant on the refinery, they get the data and they use that to predict when a steam eruption could occur, right? Okay. Now, when a steam eruption happens, there is a safety hazard and there is also a plant shutdown. Hmm. Or, or equipment shutdown, right? So with that predictive analysis, the data was al always there. Yeah, if, if you are coming from the oil and gas industry, you would know data historians. In your data historians, you have been collecting data for maybe 15, 20 years. The data is all there, right? It's about bringing the data out and bringing up those new scenarios, right? Mm -hmm. Someone was predicting coke eruptions. Someone else could do, uh, how do I improve, improve the throughput of my refining operations? Mm -hmm. The set of data remains the same, but it is all about where is your focus, what is it that you want to improve, and just dip into the data you already have. There right. are a lot of people saying that we don't have enough data, but actually if you look backside into your, in your backyard of your databases, you have enough data to actually build those analytic systems. Right. Now, Tej, you um, want to add something? Yeah, I mean, it's a very interesting point. I was, um, read a something recently which was quite frightening, which was that 90% of the data that we have cannot help us with business influencing decisions. And I think this, um, there's two aspects to the digital transformation uh, s uh, picture for me. One is that we get the data so we can get operational insights. And then the second aspect is this prognostics, this predictive analytics. Once we get the data, can we, through machine learning, through AI, 
build systems and technologies which will give us analytics and help us predict what's going to happen and help us run these plants better and more operationally. And that's exactly where my organization has been uh, looking into these areas. And I think there's a lot we can do in terms of data analytics. And I think both Microsoft, Aviva and Schneider, this is really where we are going to work very closely with uh, your, these organizations to be able to drive digital transformation because digital transformation is not just bridging the divide and getting the data. It's doing something with that data and making sure that the data you get is the right data to drive in your business. And I think predictive analytics is really a major part of the digital transformation right. story. No, I think that was an interesting point. And I think, uh, I mean, what it also means is how you can do more with less in terms of, uh, you know, the capital intensive uh, investment that you need to do. And second is how you can actually unlock that hidden uh, profitability and efficiency both along with safety.